What's up, America? Neil here with Jogger Farms Academy. Thanks for watching. Today we're going to get into a topic I guess is kind of controversial. A lot of people have weighed in on it, so we're going to throw in our throw our hats in on this one. And that is, should you or should you not, or does it matter, modify your carry gun? So let's get started. I'm going to give you this from my opinion, from my perspective of being a law enforcement officer. Also on our channel, you can look back, it's several years old now, but it, uh, it was definitely a great video and we're going to revitalize it here pretty soon, but one of, one of my really good friends is a super lawyer, it's a real thing, a defense attorney that deals directly with uh, firearm stuff and I mean obviously anything defense related, but has a lot of cases with firearms. So you can take a look at that video, it's a good video overall, but I've talked to him off screen as well, or I should say off camera as well. And uh, I can just kind of tell you what I've, what he's told me over the years. Let's say I'm at a crime scene or I'm conducting some type of investigation that turns into some criminal activity and a car is searched or whatever, whatever the, the person searched, whatever. And we're going to say that in this case that the firearm is evidence of some sort. It was used in a crime, perhaps something like that. Uh, well, we're going to first obviously take a picture of how we found the gun originally before we touch anything. Obviously as a trainer and a firearm enthusiast in general, you know, I mean, I could look at most products and I know a lot of aftermarket parts just by looking at it and I can say, oh, that, that gun has an XYZ trigger in it, especially if it's a Glock or something that's more mainstream. But at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned, as far as law enforcement is concerned, we are simply just trying to take that evidence in with as little contamination as possible, like DNA and fingerprints and, and so forth, put it in an appropriate bag and take it in and have it checked into evidence for whatever your you know, department does. Outside of that, we're not the guys out there taking guns apart, trying to figure out forensic and all that stuff. There's going to be other people who are going to be doing that or who are more qualified for that. Uh, but from our perspective, there's, I'm not going to say, well, this person shot this person. So I know that from my knowledge and training and experience that that has a modified trigger. So therefore they're more, we're going to charge them with some higher charge or something like that. It's just not a thing. Okay. And again, remember, this is not legal advice. I'm simply giving you my opinion as a police officer. So for our perspective, the modification of it has really nothing to do with anything. When people talk about modifying guns, most times we're talking about the trigger most likely because that's the mechanism that's going to allow us to fire that gun and discharge it and we don't want a situation that's going to be uh, discharging a firearm when we don't want it to be. Obviously that can lead to some serious issues. At the end of the day, uh, whether this is a two pound trigger or 12 pound trigger, I still have to make the conscious decision to press the trigger. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of law enforcement and security or whatever where, you know, we may have a, a suspect at, at gunpoint and the situation warrants where they're increasing the, the level of threat that's about to potentially happen and we may put our finger on the trigger because the odds of us having to discharge that gun to stop a crime is extremely high and that's kind of like the Everybody has that line in the sand, one more step, you know, that person with the knife or the back or whatever, where we're forced to do what we have to do. Uh, where that trigger does make a big difference. The, the wall, the trigger specifically, being able to have that wall that has a little bit of resistance um, could, could, play a, could play a role in that. If it's only a two pound trigger, and again, we're talking about under tremendous stress, could it go off before we want it to? Absolutely. Um, I've been in a, scenario on a, on a SWAT mission where we were going down a flight of stairs and I fell through the stairs. Obviously I didn't expect that and I'm a human being and had I had had I not had my finger where it should be on the side of the, the slide, you know, as you fall through, I, you know, kind of do what any human being would do and I tensed up and made like a fist. But when I did that, I kept my finger here on the slide so I didn't accidentally shoot the operator in front of me, which again is a great example of real life of having a uh, high level of trigger discipline and not putting our fingers on the trigger when we don't need to. But again, there's going to be scenarios where we're talking to a suspect where that might be the case. When we're giving that suspect one last chance and we have our finger on the trigger, if they come any closer, they do anything uh, that's going to escalate that situation, we're going to have to do that. So that's where having a defined wall and a reasonable amount of weight, what's a reasonable amount of weight? I mean, I guess uh, there is some NIJ data on that. You can probably look up as far as what, what they consider to be reasonable. Uh, the most recent site, I guess, that you could use is the Glock trigger, the new Pro Trigger. There was a previous Pro Trigger, which was... In my opinion for, for the Glock was a huge upgrade. 
which was not NIJ compliant, and then they retooled it, whatever they did to it, did their magic on it, and now it is NIJ compliant. And it's a great trigger, by the way, in case you guys are Glock people and you ever wanna upgrade that. And it's from, it's, it's an OEM trigger from Glock, so your department might allow that. Anyhow, uh, so there is some data out there of what is considered, you know, a heavy enough trigger. At the end of the day, you're responsible for every bullet that comes out of this gun. So if you shoot when you shouldn't have, and the trigger is the cause of it, it's still going to fall onto you and your responsibility. I can't tell you when I had a, an offline conversation with uh, Ian, the attorney that I, I spoke about earlier. I actually mentioned that to him because really prior to that, I I didn't know. I mean, maybe that was a thing. Maybe maybe people do get you know hemmed up on triggers and so I said I, I brought that up and I said you know I, we always talk about not modifying the trigger of the gun so that uh, you know it can't be used against them and he kind of looked at me like I had like three heads like he never heard of that before and for a guy that really does that for a living I think that's you know evidence enough that there's probably no real legal backing that's uh, gonna substantiate the fact that you modify the trigger which makes some type of criminal effect on it uh, he, I mean, he's my go-to guy for anything legal related, especially when it comes to firearms or self-defense. So I, I have to say that from a legal perspective, it doesn't sound like there's anything there. But again, who knows? Maybe that's uh, still in the works. But as of 2024, I, I haven't heard anything that has any case law or anything that's come up that would uh, change that. Again, not an attorney. So other than what we talked about as far as being able to use that firearm in a high stress situation and do it in a manner where you have full control of everything, let's talk about some things that might be an issue. And this has come up a lot actually, uh, both in law enforcement training uh, and just in general. And that is things that you put on the gun, specifically sayings and engravings that could be an issue. So. Uh, things that, uh, how do I say this uh, on YouTube, things that would portray you as someone who is actively trying to do harm to people based on the sayings and phrases of your gun, uh, that could be a problem because uh, obviously that evidence is going to be admitted when, they, uh, when you go to court and I for sure would think that that uh, attorney is going to bring up on a big screen so that everybody can see the, you know, the phrase that you put on your gun that was probably not something that you want a jury or a judge to see when making a decision uh, on using deadly force and whether it was right or wrong, that pretty much says that you're like looking for that type of activity. So I'm, I try to clean it up the best I can. Hopefully I did a good job. I, I think you guys can follow along with what I'm saying there, but phrases and sayings on guns, uh, I would think would be an issue in a court of law that would not uh, look favorable for you, especially if they're questioning whether it was justified use of deadly force. Kim brought something up off camera that I thought was a great point as well. Uh, it's something that we always are concerned about in any class that we host because, you know, especially on the entry level classes, you know, it's fairly open, minimal training necessary to come to one of those. That's the whole point, right? To get more training. And that's holstering the gun, holstering and unholstering the gun. That's if an accident's going to happen, it's either going to be from cleaning or holstering your gun. That's most likely where issues are going to occur. Uh, so we also have to be concerned about the trigger weight and things of that nature when we're talking about modifications so that we don't accidentally, you know, just the lightest touch of that trigger uh, sets it off while I'm putting it in a holster because a, a t-shirt got in the way or some material or something was in the way. Um, obviously, if we just jam the gun in the holster, that's not going to matter at all how heavy the trigger is, it's still going to go off, which is why we always emphasize in training about looking it into your holster. I know that's another whole controversial thing, which I don't know where that came from, but you should have all the time you need to either drop the gun because the police told you to or look it into the holster because the threat is no longer a threat, right? And that way we can make sure that there's no obstructions in there that would hit the trigger. But nonetheless, uh, you know, there's a reason why there's a safety lever on a 1911, okay? Uh, it's got a very light trigger and the weight of the gun itself, just touching the trigger will allow that gun to go off. So you don't, you have no chance of get, fixing that where you might have like a 226, which is a double single action gun and then double action, uh, you know, you're gonna have to really push that trigger when you're putting that in the holster for that to go off. So you have a little bit of leeway there. Again, we should be looking at it and make sure there's no obstructions, but nonetheless, uh, that trigger weight could play to an issue of a negligent discharge when you're holstering your gun. To sum this all up, again, I'm not an attorney, and this is not legal advice, I'm a police officer, but as far as modifying the gun, 
Uh, I would be wary of putting anything on there again that's going to look poorly in a court of law months later or even a year later. I wouldn't modify the trigger to an extent that makes it unsafe or unable to be able to operate that under, and again, this is the key, please take this away, under tremendous stress. Okay, I'm not talking about at the range. You could probably shoot a one pound trigger on the range safely, but uh, not under stress. And again, I don't know of any case law or any legal proceedings that would say otherwise. If you do, feel free to comment below. Uh, we will do another round with Ian coming up here pretty soon. So look forward to that. And uh, maybe we can get some questions regarding that topic uh, through there. And if you guys do have any specific questions you want for Ian, by the way, comment below. Uh, also, you can put them on our Patreon, and I guarantee you if they're on there, we're going to make sure that that gets on the list. Hopefully you found this video helpful. You know where to find us here on YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, and Instagram. And of course, we put all our premium content on Patreon. Until next time, remember, it's always better to be judged by 12 than carried by 6.